do really appreciate your presence tonight. It's uh, one of those weekends for us, and uh, you have showed up, and I appreciate it. Uh, Jacob, glad you brought your young lady friend along. You're welcome here. Uh, we're going to uh, consider tonight a continuation of the ten words. We have uh, been looking at uh, them for some time, and, and what we want to focus on tonight is which of them is the greatest commandment or is even one of them the greatest commandment. Uh, we've said when we looked at these ten commandments that they are really rules for living. That's why they were given. It was uh, God's intent that, intent that he tell Israel, here's how I want you to live. These are the rules that will help you have a good life. Uh, we're not under that law, and you understand that. We've said that a number of times. We're not under the law of Moses. We are under the uh, dispensation of grace through faith. We're under the gospel dispensation. But that doesn't mean there's not something to learn. And that's what we tried to do as we looked at these commandments is say, okay, what can I draw from that? Where can I apply that in my particular life? So let's just review them. I'll just read them for you as if uh, you were not familiar with the Ten Commandments at all, though I know that you are. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not think, make for yourselves any graven image. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. I think it's interesting that God would reduce the essence of the law to ten statements like that. You see, there was so much more in the law. Moses didn't spend 40 days on the mountain just getting those ten commandments. There were lots of other things about the law, about the priests, how they were to serve, what they were to wear, all of those kinds of things. But I want to ask, which is the greatest commandment? You know, the rabbis the Jewish leaders like to sit around and debate that. I think sometimes they had far too much time on their hands. And they got away from what was really important to nitpicking. Not that we ever do that, but they certainly did. And they like to debate which of the commandments is the greatest. Would you know that they cataloged? 613 specific commandments in the law in one of their holy books called the Talmud they gave 613 but that wasn't good enough they divided them into positives and negatives like I've got to know which ones are thou shalt and which ones are thou shalt not and would you be surprised to know that they came up with more thou shalt nots than thou shalt there were 365 thou shalt nots. <laughs> I've often wondered if that was one a day. And that left like, what, 248 that were positive thou shalt? And that wasn't even enough. Then they divided those into light and heavy commandments. Like uh, the heavy ones are the really big ones, and you better keep those. The light ones are the, well, if you've got to break one, break a light one, and it's no big deal. And then if that wasn't enough, they wanted to say, which one's the greatest of all? If you had to pick one out, what's the greatest commandment? A lot of the rabbis believed that remembering the Sabbath day was the greatest of all the commandments. They really believed that was what it was about. That was the number one of all the commandments. So what if, if they did this, what did it produce? What did it make of them? 
How did it affect their religion? Well, stated simply, it made them legalists. It made them law keepers for the sake of being law keepers. It gave them a checklist mentality. I've got to keep these check. I did that one check. Did that one check. And salvation for them became a matter of discrimination because not everybody would agree on what was light or heavy or necessary or unnecessary commandment. So it would be a matter of discrimination, wouldn't it? My list would be different from your list. And furthermore, it made it a matter of performance. How did I perform? Did I do enough? Don't you think, as believers, we are greatly concerned about whether we do enough or not? I've had people express it to me that way. I don't feel like I do enough. My stock answer is, you're right. You don't. And you can't. Because it's not a matter of doing. That's not what the law was about. That's not what grace and faith and the gospel are about. Certainly it's not. Obedience was reduced to being subjective. My list would be different than your list. And so we have a parable that Jesus gave that I think plays right into this. You remember the parable of the Good Samaritan? You can read it in Luke 10. This fellow is going uh, down the Jericho Road, and he falls among thieves and robbers, and they beat him up, and they leave him for dead. And he's lying there, in a mess, and a priest comes by. Wonder what the priest would have told the people about commandments. Would he have said anything about treating people right? Well, if he would have said it, he would not have done it because he passed by on the other side. He didn't have time. I've often wondered why. Well, I know it's just a parable. But have you ever wondered why? What, was he on his way in a hurry to get to the temple to officiate at something? He didn't have time. Uh, had he just gotten his robe out of the cleaners and was afraid that he would get blood on it, he went over and took care of this man. Uh, was he afraid that maybe the thieves and robbers were still around? This was just a ruse, and he would be placing his life in danger if he went over. I don't know, but he didn't go. Levite, same way. Priestly tribe, not a priest, but of the priestly tribe. Served in and around the tabernacle and the temple. And he just passed by on the other side too. A Samaritan came. Mixed racially. A product of uh, Jewish and Gentile marriages. I've often said there was enough Jew in them for the Gentiles not to like them and enough Gentile in them for the Jews not to like them. And yet it was a Samaritan, a man that most of them would have looked down on as a dog who went over and took care of the fellow. I wonder, I wonder what law they broke when they passed by on the other side. I wonder if that was a heavy commandment that they broke. You see, Jesus told that parable to help them understand something primarily, specifically, who their neighbor was. And so, for the Jews, there was no real connection for many of them. When I say for the Jews, that's painting with too broad a brush. But for many of them, there was no connection between the law and love. There was no connection between the law and compassion. There was no real connection between the law and joy and happiness. The law was law. Love, compassion, and joy was an entirely different thing. And they never did see that the two belonged together. So they say, let's get Jesus in on this. Let's see what he has to say. We debate it. We can't really decide. We disagree. 
we nitpick, we have all of these problems trying to figure it out. Let's get Jesus in on this. You know why? It was not because they really wanted to know what he said. It was because they thought, aha, whatever he says, some will agree, many will disagree. And so if he says, if he buys into this 16, 613 deal of laws in the Talmud, and he said it's number 287, they'd say, huh, why not 324? Why not number three? Why not remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? Because they thought they were sure that they would trap him. Jesus refused to play their silly game at all. He refused to enter this checklist kind of thing. He would not be a part of it. He knew that under the gospel which was coming, that salvation was by grace through faith, and it was not something you earned. And folks, I wish we would learn that. And I'm going to have more to say about that. Because about the time I say that, somebody says, but, but, but what about all of those things we're supposed to do? I'll talk about that later. But I want you to know that you cannot do enough ever, 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 no matter, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, to earn salvation. It is a gift from God. As a matter of fact, very clearly, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the gift of God, oh, the gift of God, is, he, is what? By grace, through faith, it's a gift from God. The word is charis, by the way, which means gift. And charis is what we get grace from. So he's just saying, you can't talk about grace without talking about a gift. You can't talk about the gift of God without considering grace. Salvation is by grace, through faith. Uh, if you're disobedient, you get what you deserve. That's payment. You can earn being punished. You can't earn being saved. It's a free gift. Well, what's Jesus going to say? I like the way he handles things. Don't you? He's cool. Jesus is really cool. He says, um, let me tell you what the first one is. And he quotes from Deuteronomy 6, what we call the Shema. Now here's what's interesting. The Shema was a bit of scripture that they put in those things called phylacteries. Have you heard about those in the Bible? You've read about phylacteries. You know what phylacteries are? They're little leather boxes that they wore one of them on their left arm and the other one on their forehead. And they put bits of scripture in there. And you know what one of the bits of scripture was? This passage from Deuteronomy 6. Because they believed you ought to keep that scripture before you. If it was on your forehead, it was like the front of your eyes. If it was on your arm, when you crossed your arm over, it was on your heart. They had it down. Let's put the Shema in the phylacteries and let's keep it before people. But they didn't get it that that was the greatest commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And he didn't stop because he said the second is so close to it that you can't separate them. And he quotes there from Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18. All Jesus did was quote scripture to them. And he says, the second one is loving your neighbor as yourself. The priest and the Levite in the story in Luke 10 broke both of those. They didn't love God enough to stop. They didn't love their fellow man enough to stop. And he said, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now stop and think about this. Get this connection. <clears throat> when we started talking about the Ten Commandments, 
we said the first four had to do with our relationship with God. We said the last six had to do with our relationship with one another. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, strength, and mind. Does that cover the first four? And he said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Does that cover the last six? He said, On these two simple commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Everything comes out of this. That's why they're the greatest. Everything we do that's right and proper comes from one of those laws comes from one of those commandments. How much better it would be in the church, and how much better it would be in the world, if we learn to love God and one another. I mean, we debate all kinds of stuff. Some, it's, some of it's so far out there on the periphery that we don't even know what it's about. But can you imagine what it would do to us if we just learn to love God first and each other second, would that solve problems? Would that solve problems in the Middle East in a heartbeat? Would that solve problems on our college campuses where people are uh, protesting and violence is broken out in a moment? Would it solve problems in our personal lives when it comes to our relationship with God through the church? Immediately. If we would learn to love God first and one another second and realize that on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Well, you know me. I've got to try to make something out of this and say there are some applications. I've got to say, what do I do? What? When I leave here after a while and I go home, uh, besides catching up on the ball game that I'm missing, and uh, besides getting a little snack, maybe a, a bowl of uh, chocolate peanut butter ice cream, my passion, by the way, uh, like uh, what, do I, what do I do besides, what do I take home from this with me? I'm going to give you three things. First of all, the Old Testament and the New Testament are not at odds. The Old Testament and the New Testament are not at odds. I think we get so wrapped up in this, we are New Testament Christians, and we are, that we forget there's an Old Testament. And we forget that there's value in the Old Testament. We forget that there are things to be learned from the Old Testament. Every once in a while, I'll, I'll preach a sermon out of the Old Testament. Somebody will comment, you preached out of the Old Testament this morning. Well, yeah, I did. Because I think there's value there. You realize that the Old Testament was to create a community through which the Redeemer would come. That's the purpose. It was to give us a nation, Israel. And through Israel, Jesus was to be born. Do you know that Jesus was a Jew? Do you know that Jesus was not Caucasian? He was not of European descent. He probably wasn't as light-skinned as any of us are. He would have had a darker and olive complexion because he was a Jew. He came out of Israel. That was the purpose of the Old Testament, to create that community through which the Redeemer would come. If you read Deuteronomy 18.15, Moses says, A prophet like me, the Lord God is going to raise up. It's a prophecy concerning the coming of Christ. Moses had been the leader of Israel for 40 years. And another prophet was going to come out of Israel who was going to be the Christ. The New Testament then reveals who that Redeemer is. From reading Deuteronomy, we don't know who the prophet was. We just know one's coming. But we read the New Testament and we meet Jesus. 
We have the birth narrative in Matthew and Luke. We have the record of things that he did, the teachings that he made, that he gave. We have his death, burial, and resurrection, his ascension back to the heaven. We meet the one who was to come. You see, if I had to say, here's what the Old Testament's about, I would say, somebody's coming. If I were to tell you what Matthew, Mark, and Luke are about, I would say, somebody's here. He came. He's the Redeemer. If I were to tell you what Romans through Revelation is about, or Acts through Revelation, I would say, watch out, he's coming back. And you need to be one of his. There's no contradiction between the Old and New Testaments. They work in concert. Romans 15 and verse 4 says, Whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through patience and help of the Scriptures might have hope. Things in the Old Testament are written for our learning. I think it's valuable to read and study the Old Testament. We're not under that covenant. We've talked about that. Galatians 3 explains that we are not under that covenant. But that doesn't mean it's bad. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It just simply means that it's been fulfilled. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, Don't think that I came to destroy the law. I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He is the fulfillment of the prophecies that were made in the law. That's what I want you to take home with you, number one. The Old Testament and the New Testament are not at odds. Number two, law and love are not mutually exclusive. I think we lean towards either law or love. Now you have to stop and think about that. That's one of those deeper things to think about. I think as a people, we either lean toward the law side or the love side. And lots of stuff. I get, I get questions all the time. Uh, you know, I do the, on the Friday or Thursday or Friday, I do the That's a Good Question podcast. And um, I, I do that because people send me questions. I don't make them up. I get them. And uh, regularly I get command, I get questions about, what about this hypothetical case? Uh, I get them about, I got one the other day about, uh, I believe uh, we should not have musical instruments in worship, but what about uh, singing a song that's religious in nature outside of the church with a guitar? And I think, okay. And you realize in regard to that, we have people who lean toward law and people who lean toward love. The law people say, well, absolutely it's wrong. No question about it. It could not be right ever because we're not supposed to use an instrument. So there. And if you pass one, you ought to close your eyes. Just in case. And other people say, you know, don't you think that that prohibition is just about corporate worship and really doesn't apply to when you're singing a song or listening to a song on the radio. I know people who even turn it off and it's on the radio and it's a religious song with a mechanical instrument accompaniment. And I say, they say, do you really think that's what that's about? That's the law and the love. We tend to go one way or the other. Right? Let me give you a scriptural example. Luke 14. Jesus is having dinner and he heals a man with dropsy. Now, we don't use that terminology to, to diagnose anybody. You go to the doctor and say, I think you have dropsy. And uh, that's been described as I drop and don't have the energy to get up. But that's not what dropsy is. Dropsy was, we would call it an edema. It's fluid collecting somewhere in the tissue of your body. And Jesus healed him. But do you know what day it was? 
It was the Sabbath. Ought not have done that, Jesus. You're not supposed to do work on the Sabbath. Like Jesus saying, be healed is a lot of work for him. He said, man, that made me tired. And so they jumped on him and they said, you broke the Sabbath. He said, which one of you, if your donkey or your ox falls in a ditch on the Sabbath, doesn't go and pull him out? Do you get the import of that? It's like, is your donkey or your ox more important than this man who's suffering from dropsy? If you can pull him, out, that animal, out of the ditch on the Sabbath, I can heal this man on the Sabbath. It's like, now answer that. And they had no answer. But you see, there were the, was the law and the love. The law said, you violated the Sabbath. Don't do that. The love said, yeah, but you know, uh, the Sabbath was created for man, not man for the Sabbath. And you need to understand there are exceptions to that. Which side do you go on the most? Are you the law person? Are you the love person? What I get from what Jesus said is that you don't have to be either because one is in concert with the other. It's love that motivates us to keep the law, the commandments. Jesus said it this way, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep the commandments. In Galatians 5, 6, Paul said, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcision avails anything. but faith and love works motivated by love. Obedience growing out of love. You don't have to be a law person as opposed to a love person. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. We need to learn that God saves us by His grace through faith. What a wonderful idea. What a wonderful thing that is. How we ought to appreciate that. And grace is heaven's provisions for our salvation. God says, you don't deserve this. You can't earn this. I'm going to give it to you. Now faith is your response. And faith involves some action. Faith is not just saying, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Please save me. Amen. Uh, that's not what faith is. Faith is active. Read Hebrews 11. All of those great heroes of faith who did something, right? When Noah was moved by faith, what did he do? Built an ark. And you go through there, every one of the examples says something they did through their faith. So law and love are not mutually exclusive. And number three, Christianity is not a matter of record keeping. Now we know that, don't we? But don't you think sometimes we act like it is? Uh, we, want, we want God to take note of all the things we do. And as a matter of fact, to make sure God knows about it, we go around and tell others what we did. Well, I did this. I really don't want anybody to know this. So. Yeah, why are you telling me? I don't want nobody, but so-and-so needed help, and I went out and helped him. I was bragging on Sam, and I do that quite often, because I don't know anybody in the congregation who is any more kind-hearted and who's willing to help people any more than Sam. You, you have something you need if he can do it. And I was bragging on him. He said, I didn't do it to be told. Well, he didn't tell me. He didn't tell anybody. The person he did it for told me. And I have a right to brag on him. And I can brag on the rest of you, many of you, by the same token. 
But we kind of think like, I attended church so many times, and did you know how much money I gave? God, take, put that down, increase my contribution. And uh, I made a visit to the hospital, of all things, and I cooked a meal for somebody and took it to them. And God, surely, 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 I've earned a little bit of heaven. No, you haven't. Not a minute inside the pearly gates. It is not record keeping. Ephesians 2, beginning with 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Hmm. What are you saying, Paul? He says we're not saved by works of merit. We can't earn it. But we're saved to work. There's that love and law thing. We're so in love with the one who saved us by grace. We're so grateful for what he's done for us that we just want to help all the people we can and do all the good we can as long as we can. That's where works come in. They're not to earn salvation. They grow out of and flow out of the fact that we are saved. You know, there's no way in the world you can be saved by a law system, although a lot of people try it. Because the only way to be saved by a law system is to keep all the laws perfectly all the time. Can you do that? I mean, do you realize if you go down the highway and, and they really are patrolling this section of Chapman Highway where they're doing work down there, and it's a 40-mile zone. You realize if you go 41 miles an hour, you've broken the law. 41. They can, by right, arrest you, give you a ticket. Now, there are some questions about the accuracy of the machines and all of that, so they give you some leeway. I know that because I commented to my wife as we were going to South Oxford the other day, I said, we've got to be really careful about this because they're patrolling heavily and, oh, right there sits a policeman. And I looked down and I was going more than 40. So I know that he is allowing some liberty there. That's grace. But you can never be saved by a law system unless you keep it perfectly, and not a one of us can do that. Quit trying to earn salvation. Quit trying to earn it. You can't. Just serve God out of a pure heart of thanksgiving and praise and glory and honor. God, I love you. I want to be here. I want to be with my brothers and sisters of Christ. I want to worship you. You are God, I want to encourage other people who are here too. I want to encourage Tom when he gets up there and rambles on and on and on. I want him to know that I'm here to hear what he has to say. That's the connection of law and grace. So please learn those things from this greatest commandment. Here's my conclusion. Love for God and others are the two greatest commandments. You want to reduce it to its lowest common denominator? Did you learn that in math? Here's the lowest common denominator. Love God and love one another. They cover all the others. Obedience, gospel obedience, good deeds, righteous living, so on. Fall under one of those. Let's work at knowing and loving God and those whom God loves. And that's everybody, by the way, even those with whom, with whom we have great disagreement. And love and law are not enemies. They're allies. Did you get it? Shake your head this way.